5 a.m., Sunday, April 6, 1862. Southern Tennessee. A place called Pittsburgh Landing, the battle known as Shiloh, is about to begin. Deadly torrents of lead shattered the crisp, cool morning as wave after wave of southern gray brought a swift reversal to the action that had shaped events over the past two months. Two months earlier, on February 6, Union gunboats approached Fort Henry, a weakly defended earthwork guarding the Tennessee River. After quickly pounding Fort Henry into submission, an unknown 39-year-old general, Ulysses S. Grant, marched two columns of troops 12 miles overland to attack Fort Donaldson, a new Confederate stronghold blocking the Cumberland River. During the march, the February weather was unseasonably mild, and sweating soldiers carelessly discarded their blankets and overcoats. The following evening, a cold rain turned to sleet and snow. By morning, hundreds of Union soldiers were severely frostbitten. Some had actually frozen to death. Stunned yet undaunted by the weather, General Grant wrapped 27,000 men around the perimeter of Fort Donelson. A rebel breakout failed. The two ranking Confederate officers fled by boat, leaving General Simon Buckner to ask for surrender terms. Back came Grant's famous reply, no terms, but an unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. This blunt declaration came at a time when the North had little to celebrate. It caught the people's fancy, and the quiet little store clerk from Illinois became Unconditional Surrender Grant. The North could claim a hero, but much more significant was the fact that Union armies now controlled two rivers leading directly into the heartland of the South, the Tennessee and the Cumberland. The capture of Forts Henry and Donelson punctured the center of the southern line, a line which had earlier stretched through Kentucky from Columbus to Bowling Green. Now the Confederate commander of the West, 59-year-old Albert Sidney Johnston, was forced to establish a new line along the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Nashville, a vital industrial and manufacturing site, had to be abandoned. And by late March, a Confederate army of 44,000 had concentrated near Corinth, Mississippi, a major rail center. This rail center was the next target of the Union Army. Just 20 miles to the north, 40,000 Union soldiers were loosely encamped at Pittsburgh Landing, an old steamboat stop on the Tennessee River. Their orders were to wait for reinforcements from General Don Carlos Buell's army of 20,000 stationed in Nashville. The Union front extended from Pittsburgh Landing three miles to a small Methodist meeting house called Shiloh Church. It lay in a clearing on a slight hill and on the main road leading to Corinth. With Confederate fortunes sagging, Johnston, a daring and capable officer, prepared to hit Grant's army before Buell's reinforcements arrived. His advance, however, was stalled a full day by mix-ups and mud. General Pierre Beauregard, second in command to Johnston, insisted the attack be called off. He was sure the element of surprise had been lost and that Buell's forces had already arrived. But Johnston would not be swayed. We strike at dawn. Tomorrow night, we will water our horses in the Tennessee River.
Saturday, April 5, was bright and warm. And while Union soldiers bathed and relaxed in Owl Creek, General William Sherman assured Grant that he in no way expected anything like an attack. And Grant, comfortably quartered in nearby Cherry Mansion, passed the word along. Meanwhile, contrary to Beauregard's fears, Buell's army of 20,000 was still a day's march away. Instead of church bells calling the faithful to worship, Sunday morning, April 6, was ushered in with the ring of small arms fire and the crash of artillery. By early afternoon, a formless Union line began to tighten in places, and some of the deadliest fighting in American history was beginning to take place. orchard, streams of bullets cut the blossoms to pieces. They fell to the ground like gently falling rain. Thirsty wounded on both sides crawled to a nearby pond, staining it red as they drank. Ever after it would be known as Bloody Pond. An old country road, worn down by erosion, was the scene of fighting so savage it was labeled the hornet's nest. Confederate forces assaulted this ditch time after time until they lost count. Finally, by late afternoon, it was encircled by southern troops. 2,000 prisoners were taken. However, the delaying action of these blue-coated prisoners had kept the Union Army from being destroyed. During the fierce battle at the Hornet's Nest, a bullet struck the Confederate commander, General Johnston, in the leg, cutting an artery. He grew pale, reeled in the saddle, and fell to the ground. In no obvious pain and without speaking a word, he simply looked up into the sky and died. And with him died any real hope of a Confederate victory. Later that same evening, General Grant made a last-ditch stand near the river, turning back a determined but exhausted Confederate charge. The woodlands all around continued to smoke and flame, but the day's fighting was over. The night was dreadful. Toward midnight, a violent thunderstorm drenched the living, and sudden flashes of lightning illuminated the dead and wounded lying everywhere, the mute and lifeless sharing the same ground with those chanting weak calls for help. One Confederate soldier wrote, God grant that I may never be the partaker in such scenes again. When released from this, I shall ever be an advocate of peace. By the morning of April 7, Buell's reinforcements had arrived. Now the Union Army took the initiative. Rebel soldiers were driven into a scattered retreat until one brigade dug in near Shiloh Church, blocking the road to Corinth. But Union troops continued to press forward. Finally, at 2 p.m., General Beauregard, now in command, ended the unequal struggle. His Confederate army retired from the field and began a slow, heavy-footed march toward Corinth. Not a single Federal soldier pursued. A vigorous Union pursuit might have destroyed Beauregard's army. 
But the hard fact was that both armies were thoroughly drained. Two armies had met here. Yet, in a sense, they were not really armies. The battle had been fought by a collection of raw recruits, privates and officers alike. They had, however, fought long and hard, and the results were bloody and costly. The North counted over 13,000 dead, wounded, and missing, while Southern casualties totaled more than 10,000. General Grant recalled later in his memoirs, I saw an open field so covered with dead that it would have been possible to walk across the clearing in any direction, stepping on dead bodies without a foot touching the ground. Burial details worked for a full week, sometimes digging regular graves, sometimes merely tossing dirt over dead bodies. In one place, a huge trench held over 700 southern soldiers, placed in rows and stacked seven deep. What had begun a year before with flags and cheers and drum beats and brave words was now beginning to change drastically. The encounter at Shiloh underscored some basic facts of human warfare, that it was deadly serious business, and that it was being fought by impassioned men who would not quit until thoroughly beaten. After the capture of Fort Donelson, a Union soldier wrote, my opinion is that the war will be closed in less than six months. After Shiloh, the same soldier wrote, if my life is spared, I will continue in my country's service until this rebellion is put down, should it be 10 years. On paper, Shiloh was a draw. In reality, it was one of the decisive battles of the war. Shiloh was the hinge as the door began to swing open, exposing the entire Mississippi Valley. General Robert E. Lee immediately foresaw the grave consequences. He warned that if the Mississippi Valley was lost, the Confederate states along the Atlantic coast would be ruined. Shiloh Church was built for the Prince of Peace and named after an Israelite town in Ephraim, a town where the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant had stood and where the boy Samuel had heard voices and seen a mighty vision. Now, several thousand years later, on another continent, a bleak frame building gave the name new meaning. Shiloh. Bloody Shiloh. Words voiced and echoed throughout a war-torn nation. Words that described the first large-scale conflict between divided families in a divided country. Yet the clash at Shiloh was only the beginning, a faint silhouette of the horror and desolation that would haunt the land for three years to come.